Do what? Oh, yes, I will certainly do that. Thank you. Broadcast. Section 2.6, the approximation of Euler, or Euler's method is what this is. And actually, this has technically got the name that it is the uh, forward Euler method. And please pronounce his name correctly. It's not as big of a pet peeve as reading out the natural log as LN, but it's still, it's his name, so give him some credit. Um, he's a, one of the top mathematicians of all time. It's not Euler, it's E-U-L-E-R. It's right here too, by the way. It's not Euler, it is Euler. Euler, as in the old uh, Houston Oilers. Okay. okay. I gotta get my notes so I fill in the right blanks. But essentially, what we're gonna be doing is algebra. Um, since we know at the starting point what the slope of the solution is, we're gonna move just a certain distance along the x axis and follow that slope. So recall that at the point x naught, y naught, this function value at that point, if you plug in, your initial conditions into the right-hand side, you'll have the slope of the solution at the starting point. Okay, So let me draw a picture for you, and you do the best you can to kind of match this. I do okay with this tablet, but I've done worse. And could possibly do very bad. Who knows? Let's say x naught is right there, and let's say y naught is right there. Okay, so this right here, I'm going to call this point zero just for now. And it has coordinates, x naught, y naught, obviously. Um, let's say, just for argument's sake, that this direction right here represents a, a line of slope f of x naught, y naught, through p naught. So, you know, whatever the solution is doing, we know that as we get close to that point, it matches that slope. So the solution can be something like this, right? Possible solution. But we don't know what the solution's equation is. We're going to assume we can't solve the differential equation. Maybe that f is too complicated, it's not separable, it doesn't make an exact, and it's not linear. So in those cases... We may not even have the ability to find the solution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a step size, h. And I'm going to move this direction, and that distance there I'm going to call h. So if I call this x1, x1 can be found as just x0 plus h. Now if I go all the way up to this line here, that point right there, I'm going to call y1, that height here. And so what I need to do is, can I find a formula for y1? What is y1 equal based on what I know? I know that I have the slope is f of x naught y naught. I know the coordinates of p naught, and I know I'm taking a step size of h in the x direction. I should be able then to find out what the height of that point y1 is by first finding the equation of this line and then plugging in x0 plus h in for x. Right? You can find the equation of a line using point-slope formula. That's what we need. Now this actual, I'm going to do this in green. You don't have to draw this line here on your notes, but this height right here is actually y at x1, which is what I was talking about up here on the board. You know, our, our ultimate goal here is then that y1 is an approximation of y at x1. The smaller the h, the closer it should be, assuming that the solution is a continuous function. Okay, so that's the picture. You get the idea? Euler's method? And then what we'll do is we'll start over. We have this new point, y1. We're going to find the slope at y1. 
by plugging X1, Y1 into the, uh, the F again and start the whole process over. Once we get a formula for Y1, it turns out it's going to be the same formula for Y2, just based on X1 plus H instead of X0 plus H. Okay. So first of all, help me find, what's the equation of the line? Or y minus y1. Y, let's use this point here. Y Since that's the one we know. Minus y yeah. It equals, it's all right, don't worry. Equals y naught over x naught. Uh, y naught uh, over, no, I'm not going from this point here, the origin, out to this one. Right, that's not the change in y over change in x. Right? Yeah, we don't actually know the change in y and over change in x other than we know what the slope of that line is. Right? What is the slope of that line? F of x not y not. So we just plug that directly in. Y'all recognize what formula I'm using, right? You know your point slope formula. x not y not times x minus x not. So there's your slope. Okay, so this means that y is equal to f of x naught y naught times x minus x naught plus y naught. I just solved for y there. Actually, you know, it's it's much more common to write this y naught first. Exactly. So now we want to know what is the y at x1, right? y1 would be what happens if we plug in this x1 right there into this x right there, right? So that means y1 would be y0 uh, plus f of x0, y0, and now plug in x1 right there. So what is x1? Well, remember, x1 is x0 plus h, right? Mm -hmm. So the distance between x1 and x0, x1 minus x0, is going to be just h, right? See that? So then, here's what your formula looks like. In fact, I've got it written down in typeface down below, but it's y naught plus h times f of x naught y naught. So that, that's what this right here is, right? So what basically I'm going to do in Euler's method is I'm going to build a table and I'm going to basically construct this next point the same way every single time. So as I go to the next page, notice I'm just going to start over. So H is a number. It's your chosen step size. So in a given problem, I, say, I may say choose 0.1 or choose 0.05 or choose 0 0.005. And so you'll take your first step and you'll plug in to find your first y, your first approximation point, by taking your first y, the y0, which is given in your initial condition, and then you plug in x0 and y0 into your right-hand side on your de. Multiply that times h, take the sum, and you've got now where your guess is for your y1. But then you start over, and now, from that point, we do the exact same thing again. Now, we've got an x1, we've got a y1, we've got a point, we know a slope, we want to take a step, size h, to get to x2. We would find the point there, go in that direction, but now the slope is f of x1, 
y1 instead of x0, y0. Problem is, we're now going to get slightly further away from the solution because this point right here wasn't even on the solution. But we don't have a choice. We don't know what the solution is. So that's our best guess for where the solution would be at x1. And so we take a step from there. So the further we go, the further away we're going to actually get from the solution. But the smaller the h, we hope we stay closer longer is the idea. Okay? So if I did the exact same process again, I would get that x2 now is x1 plus h. And then y2 is y1 plus h f of x1 y1. And so on. which is basically what this formula right here tells you. You can just keep going on and on and on as far as you want to go. So we're going to do one of these by hand, and then we're going to realize nobody actually does this by hand. And we'll plug it into Excel or some other tool that actually does this for us. But we've got to understand how we build the formulas to understand how Euler's method works. All right, are you with me so far? Make sense? Mm -hmm. So let us consider um, this problem right here, this initial value problem, y prime equals x square roots of y. My initial condition is y of 1 is equal to 4. So this right here is my f. f of x, y is x square roots of y. Just for the record, would you be able to solve that differential equation analytically? Yes. What is it? What kind is it? It's separable. it's separable, right? In your mind right now, go through the list. Is it separable? Is it linear? Is it exact? Exact's hard to check just by eyeballing it unless you convert to the differential form. But first one you always check is, is it separable? Can I divide the y's to one side and the x's to the other? And yes. Divide the square root of y to the left-hand side. It'll be dy over square root of y equals x dx. So that works. Um, by the way, your x naught and your y naught are 1 and 4. Okay, so essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the approximation value at each one of these x's. Notice I'm taking a step size of 0.1 from my initial condition x naught equals 1. So I'll do it at 1.1, and then the next one will be 1.2, 1.3. Um, so... To look at this in table form, here's what I'm trying to find. Here's my xn and here's my yn. So at 0, my x0 and my y0 are given, 1 and 4. I know that after one step, I'm going to be at the starting value of x plus h, which would be, be 1.1. After 2, I'd be at 1.2. After 3, I'd be at 1.3. After 4, 1.4. And after 5, at 1.5. Okay? So I need to figure out each of these y values because I claim that those would be approximations of what the solution is at 1.1, 1.2, and so forth. So just use your formulas. x1 would be x0 plus h, we know, makes that 1 plus 0.1 or 1.1. y1 is going to be y0 plus f of x0 y0 with an h in there. Sorry, I left off the h. So that's 4 plus 0 0.1 times x naught, which is 1, times the square root of y naught, which is 4. Again, that's f of x naught y naught, or f of 1 comma 4. Which gives me 4.2. Sense? Mm -hmm. 
So we got 4.2 there. Boom. And then you just keep going, right? Start over again. X2 would be X1 plus H or 1.1 plus 0.1, which equals 1.2, which we knew, but we went ahead and wrote it out. Y2 would be Y1 plus H F of X1, Y1. So, 4.2 is Y1 from here, plus 0 0.1 times X1 square root of Y1, 1.1 1 .1 times the square root 4.2. So you got to pull out your calculator. What do you get? Give me about five decimal places. 1.3254. That doesn't sound right. It should be close to 4.4. 4. 4. That's what I got. 4.4243. Four Four point four two five four three. X three, Y three, and continue. One point three. This would be four point four two. 543 plus 0 0.1 times 1 1.2 square root of 4.42543. And I got in my notes here 4.67787. So double check that. And I didn't do the rest in my notes because I got tired of doing it. By hand, that is. <clears throat> But that's really all there is to the Euler method, the forward Euler method. To doing it, I mean, it's one of the easiest ones to understand, even by hand. Unfortunately, like I said, nobody really uses it because it's so slow. But it's the foundation for what we will do in other types of approximations. Okay. Okay. So, are you guys Excel wizards? You know how to use formulas in Excel, all right? Yes. So now you know a little bit. I mean, you. Oh, you're inside the Wikipedia. You didn't take it with me. Oh, yeah. So, you will learn more about it. But one of the things that's nice about Excel is that it has this ability for you to build formulas based on cell location by reference, not by absolute variable, you know, location. Right. I mean, you can do both, but like. This is, this is a perfect example of where Excel would shine because all I'm doing is I'm basing the formula based on what was just done, right? So all my formulas would just be based on the row just above um, and would be able to build a table like this straight in Excel, okay? So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to use Euler's method in Excel first, and then I'm going to show you that I think one of the tools that I gave you, I haven't double-checked this actually before I got here, but I, I assume that one of our di direction field tools has Euler's method built right into it because that's how they're drawing the curves on the screen anyways. 
is they're just using a small H and drawing the curve based on Euler's method. Okay, so I'm going to release control of your desktops, and I want you to now follow along with me instead of just watching me do this. Um, I'm going to go and open up Microsoft Excel, and we're going to build the table that we had on the right-hand side of our notes by just starting with a blank workbook. So essentially, I want a column for n, I want a column for my x sub n, and I want a column for my y sub n. So I'm just going to label my headers as n, x, n, y, n. I'm going to center those. And up here at the top, I'm going to, at the top of my spreadsheet, just so I have the, the absolute value of, uh, or the, the fixed value, I should say, of H somewhere on my spreadsheet so that I can change H and look and see what happens if I, if I modify that. Um, I'm going to come actually over here to cell F. Uh, we'll, we'll actually modify that slightly. Um, I'm going to put H over here in this column, and for reasons that will become clear later on. I'm going to put H equals in F1, and in G, I'm going to put 0 0.1. Okay. So, of course, we'll start with n equals 0, and 1 and 4 were given in the problem. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to, for, for Excel, we're not going to have the formula stored somewhere. We're just going to hard code it into the formula that we actually make. That is the formula for f. Okay, so n's are just going to march down. So, if I put it at n equals 1 in row 3 and highlight those two cells, I can use Excel to fill in as many rows as I want down by dragging the handlebar. So once you have 0 and 1 in A2 and A3, if you hover your mouse over that little black dot at the bottom right of your highlighted region, there's a little, actually green dot, I should say, right there. If I put my mouse right over that, I get a different kind of crosshairs. If I drag that down, it just automatically fills for me. We'll do 4 for now because that's all I need. You make sure you highlight both the 0 and the 1. If you just drag the 1 down, it stays 1. But if you highlight both of those, Excel figures out, oh, well, he's trying to count upwards from 0. Okay. So x1, now, remember the formula for this is always going to be the value of the previous x plus h. So instead of typing it manually, I'm going to put equals to indicate that I'm doing a formula. And then I'm going to take and reference a cell adjacent to it, which is b2. And the way that Excel will fill this or copy this formula to other cells is by always thinking of that part of the formula means the cell just above me. So if I fill this down to the other formula, other cells in that column, it's going to just always put in that place the cell above it, plus the H. And where is the H value? G1. I can click on it or I can type G1. But I want it to always refer to G1, not two rows up and five rows or five columns over. I want it to absolutely reference G1 all the time. So the trick in Excel is to put a dollar sign in front of both the column and the row so that there are absolute references of row, absolute reference of column. Again, you guys who know Excel, um, you guys already know this. Um, if you don't know Excel, I'm, I'm explaining it slow so you can type it right. You could probably figure out how to even figure out the rest of the table, and if you want to give it a shot, go for it. But the idea is the same. For y, only I'm going to use the formula for Euler. So you got that if I hit enter, now there's my 1.1. And this is the part that I like. You'd click on just that 1.1 again, highlight 
or hover over the handlebar at the bottom right, drag it down, and it fills the formula for you. You got the formula right, B2 plus dollar sign G dollar sign 1, and your H was in G1. That's what you should get in that column. All right, so let's try to figure out what the formula in this case for this particular F would be for Euler's method. All right, Euler's method is the previous Y. Right, so if I'm in this column and this cell, Y1 is the cell above it plus what? By the way, I'm using the formula in your notes, just uh, YN, or YN plus 1 is YN plus H. Right, my H is up here. But I want dollar sign G, dollar sign 1, times... So that's the previous y plus h times f of the previous x and y. Now, in this case, I don't have an f formula, so I'm just going to type it in. It's going to be the previous x times the square root of the previous y. Notice how that part of the formula right, right here, from b2 to times square root of C2, that's going to be different based on what different F's you have. So I gave you an F of X is Y is X plus Y, or E to the X, Y, or something like that. You would put different um, formulas, but it would be based on the values in B2 and C2. Again, that's just X square roots of Y. So I'm using the previous X and the previous Y. Make sense? Enter. And hover, drag. Our numbers match. 1.2, I did actually say go to 1.5. I don't know why I stopped at 4 now that I think about it. Double, make sure your formula looks right to you. C2 plus, and this is in cell C3. Any, any problems? Things wrong on your screen? Okay, so again, what this tells us, this says that this value right here is an approximation of what y at 1.5 would actually be. It's not the value of y at 1.5, so that's, that's what we call y5, based on this particular h right there. So I got 5.27081. In fact, I'm going to type that off to the side over here just to kind of hold it in place. Control C, I'm gonna paste that value there. Now I've got that number stored. Here's what I wanna do different. I wanna change my H, I wanna cut it in half. And I still wanna approximate Y at 1.5. So instead of using H as 0.1, let's use half of that, 0.05. But I still wanna know what the Y is approximately at 1.5. So what have I got to do? How many steps? Probably 10, right? Oh, I did that wrong. Let's try that again. There we go.
So I can still approximate y at 1.5 using a smaller step size, and I've got now 5.30871. What would you hope would be true? You would expect that this number here is actually a better approximation closer to the actual solution than this one was. Is there like a limit to, your, to the size of that in Excel? Like you just keep going smaller and smaller. There is a, what's called a machine epsilon, a smallest possible wow. value, because Excel, um, you know, on all of these machines is probably a 32-bit floating point right. system, and so you, you have a finite number of real numbers that you can store in memory. In our numerical analysis class, we actually talked about the smallest number difference that you can have between any two numbers. Because <laughs> it's a discrete value. Right? I can make it super small, but I'll evaluate it for So if you do 0. 0.00001, let's do a really small. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste its value right there. So points, I don't care how small you go. <laughs> so I want to keep going. See the problem with taking really small step sizes? If I want to approximate the value at 1.5, what have I got to do? I've got to go along stinking way. I'm not even close. Maybe I should try not so many zeros. What if you just left room that, like, I have mine, I kind of got behind, and mine's just 0, 1, 2, 5 still, and I put in point zero 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 one, and my 5 is still there? As long as you get, I mean, the point is to get, I don't care what really is in the end column, that's kind of extra information. If I, I need to get this X column to go all the way down to 1.5. Oh, there it is. 5.34. The problem, I mean, well, maybe a problem. One way to, to kind of conceive of this issue is that you're never going to get exactly the right value, but you can get as close as you want to but it takes more work to get closer. It takes more computations to get a better approximation. Okay? <clears throat> um, were you able, was everybody able to, uh, I guess, who are following along and doing this in Excel, get a different H to work besides the one we started with? Or think you can do it on your own? Because you're going to want to do this in the homework. I'm going to post a, a, this Excel spreadsheet or a, a version of it so that you can modify it to do your own. I, I, what I'd like to do is one more because I want to put a couple more columns in here of interest um, that I think would be helpful for us to understand how close we are actually getting to the solution. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go back and make sure you can get to this point where I did 0.05. I'm going to delete all of these extra columns. <laughs> Or rows, I should say. Can you get to there is the real question. Yes. So before I only had five rows, or six counting the zero, when I had point one in there. And again, what I did was I changed that G1 cell to point oh five. I highlighted seven. B7 and C7, and then I just drag that formula down. All right, this is what I had. That's what you got with me the first time. So I'm going to change that G1 to 0.05. And I'm going to highlight this and fill it all the way down to... Um, well. All 
All right. Now, go ahead. You've got a problem on um, the next page of your notes, comparison of approximate and actual values. I've given you another initial value problem. I gave you y prime is 2xy. y1 is 1. So here's my f. There's my x naught. There's my y naught. And I want us to do find an approximation at 1.5 in two cases. I want us to find for h is 0.1, and then I'm going to repeat the whole process and do h is 0.05, just like I was doing with the previous one. So the only thing that I really need to change is my x0, y0, and my f in my formulas. So let's go back to Excel, and let's change h to 0.1. My x0 is 1, and my y0 is now 1. My x formula doesn't change, but my y formula will, because I've got a different formula for f. So it's still the previous y, which is c2 plus h, which is g, dollar sign 1, dollar sign g, dollar sign 1, times now, and my new formula is 0.2xy. So 0.2 times the previous x, which is b2, times the previous y, which is c2. Enter. You should get 1.02 if you did that right. Um, I only want to go down to 1.5. I need to, this formula in, the, in like cell C4 is wrong. I need to fill the formula I just created all the way down to actually see the approximation. So again, what I did was I clicked on cell C3, dragged over or hovered over the handlebar, and then dragged that all the way down. Now, before I do 0.05 and take twice, you know, get all the way down to 1.5 in 10 steps instead of 5 steps, I want to point out that this is another separable differential equation, and if you went through the whole process, you could actually find the actual solution, but I gave it to you on your notes there at the bottom. I tell you what the actual solution is if you solve this um, initial value problem by hand. It's y equals 0.1x squared minus 1. So what I want to do is I want to actually measure how far away am I from the actual solution. And there's two types of errors that we typically work with to do that. One is called absolute error. And one is called a relative error. So in your notes, real quick, go ahead and write these in just so you have these formulas. Uh, absolute error is the absolute value of the actual value <clears throat> minus the approximation. The relative error is actually a better measure because it doesn't change based on how big or what scale of numbers that you're working with. It's more of an um, absolute so it's more of a, a measure that's comparable between different problems that may be on different scales. Like So if your differential equation had to do with measuring the amount of salt in a vat of uh, a giant 50-gallon drum and your numbers are in 300-gram range, and then another problem, you're working at temperatures 
that range from 0.01 degrees to 0.02 degrees, the size of your numbers are vastly different. So on one, I might have that my error is 0 0.00005, and the other one, I might have that my error is 0.1. And it sounds like one was a whole lot better than the other, but they're really both about the same because the 0.1 was with much larger numbers, and the 0 0.0005 was with smaller scale numbers. So relative error allows us to compare the method across different size scale problems. So what you do is you take that absolute error and divide it by the original actual value. So what this formula actually looks like is actual value minus the approximation all divided by the absolute value of the actual value. And then if you take that and multiply it by 100, you get what's called the percentage. Relative error is... I don't generally do that or include that column in any of the data that I present, but it is not uncommon for that to be seen in examples that are developing new methods. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to my Excel spreadsheet. I'm going to put a column in there for actual value, and I'm going to put a column in there for relative error. Okay, so if I go back to Excel, I'm going to put a column for what Y actually is at X sub n. Remember, Y in, just Y sub n is an approximation, but Y at X, at X in means the actual solution at those points. And since I have the formula, I'm just going to type that sucker in. This is equal to E raised to a power. You remember how in Excel you raise E to a power? It's not just E raised to a power. It's, it's called the exponential function, EXP. Of point 0.1. times x squared, and where's my x value? I'm plugging in x in, so I'm going to plug in this. Squared, minus 1, and actually I need the x squared minus 1 in parentheses. This is 0.1 times all of that and then close that. So my formula here depends on the current x value, which is B2. So it's e to the 0.1 times the quantity x squared minus 1. That had better give me 1, or I've given you the wrong solution. Because we know that point is on there. We know x1, sorry, x equals 1, y equals 1 is a solution point. It's the initial value, so it had better match. But now I'm just going to drag that down. And this column is going to represent the exact solution. Or as exact as Excel can get because it still rounds to like 15 decimal places, but... It's close enough. This is the row we're looking at right now. We want to know 1.5. How close are we? So I'm going to make a column here that I'm going to call percent relative error. So for each row, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate how close is this number to this number. Okay? Column D is actual. Column C is approximate. So in my formula for percentage relative error, I'm just going to plug in 
the value for that row in column D as the actual, and the value for that row in column C for the approximate. So if this becomes equal to the absolute value of actual minus approximate divided by the absolute value of the actual And I'm not actually going to put times 100 because I'm going to use the format in Excel to make it a percent. Should that be zero? No. We should be exact at the starting place. What was the formula again for the Y of the term? EXP, parentheses, 0.1 times parentheses, B2 squared. Minus one, close parentheses, close parentheses. Why does that not need the E here? Because it do, Excel doesn't know what that number means. Okay. Excel doesn't have a variable stored in its memory that means E. Okay. So if we want to do E raised to a power, you've got to do it as EXP of something. Right. So E to the F of X is EXP of F of X, whatever that formula is. It has to do with what Excel knows and what it doesn't know. It doesn't know E. It knows E as a function. So how is our E getting E? Oh. E so EXP so of something means E to that something. Oh, and then exponent of, or power? Zero point zero. Well, you can do B2 raised to the second. There is a POW command, but you don't have to use it because it does know how to take any number and raise it to a power. It just doesn't know what the number E is. So if you wanted to type in 2.718281828 and raise it to something, that would work. But the equivalent of function in Excel is just like this. Just like you would take the sine or cosine of something or the square root of something, you could do it this way. Minus 1. Okay. Can you show me the formula for C3 real quick? C3. Should be, this is, uh, this was in cell B. No. What was B2? B1. Use its, this should be equals C2, previous Y, plus H, which is dollar sign G, dollar sign 1, times, and then for our formula, F was 0 0.2 times B2 times C2. Okay. All right. So how far off are we? I'm going to click on my formula that I just typed in for percent relative error. I'm actually going to change that to percent by clicking the percent format on the home ribbon. So it actually will automatically turn those decimals into percent. So I have to manually put in 100 as a factor, and just drag that down. And let's get more decimal places. So I'm going to increase the decimal by clicking this increase decimal option here. Boom, boom, boom. Do about three. So this is the one I'm looking at. My relative error was 0.642%. Okay. So when H was 0.1, I got a relative error of 0.642%. I'm just going to type that in right there for my reference. Now let's change that to 0.05. Now instead of looking at this row, I'm looking at this row. My approximate value, my exact value. So for an H of 0.05, I got about 
By the way, it's all being recorded, so if you need to go back and walk through this again on your own to catch anything that I missed or try to catch up or recreate it, you can do so. I'll, I'll take this spreadsheet basically as it is and save it and put it as an attachment to that uh, YouTube link that I give you. Now, here, notice something. Again, back to the order H thing that I was talking about before where cutting your H in half cuts your error in half. That's about what happened, right? In, in a neighborhood, it's not going to be exact because of what this order H actually means, but it means pretty close to we cut my error in half by cutting my H in half. I'm still off at a... Um, hundredths decimal place in terms of absolute difference between those two. So that's not great, but it's, uh, it's reasonable to see how this particular method works. Okay, so in your homework for this section, you're going to be asked to apply Euler's method to several different um, problems and either use Excel or do it by hand. I thought I'd go take a quick look by going to Blackboard for our class and uh, going to the link that I gave you for direction fields. Oh, that's too big. Yeah, I got, a, I got an early one. I've been here since before we were on power campus. So I don't know why I don't have like a one or a two. I should have one of the earliest ones. <laughs> 1182, that's what I am. All right, so uh, in our class in differential equations, um, I did place links for um, DE tools online. One of them was a direction field, build your own. So I'm just going there. And I'm hoping, ah, numerical solution tables. All right, so let's take our 0 0.2 times x times y. And notice my options under which type of method for my solution. There's Euler. There's improved Euler, midpoint, Rangakata, the Rangakata 3 is. We'll talk about all these other four later on that are much better. But this Euler is exactly the Euler that we're talking about right now. It's the simplest of all. So if I do point 0.1 and uh, my starting point, I'm going to do 1 comma 1. I'm going to submit that. There's that approximation curve. Notice my 1.5 values. I got down here a table of, of values. That 1.12588 will match what I did over here when I had point 0.1 here. Right there. Matches it. It's the same formula. Okay. So as long as you can figure out how to type it into either this, you don't have to even actually have to do Excel to be able to do this. I just want to show you a couple of the tools that are available to you, but you've got to be able to figure out what goes on inside here. Um, if I do a point 0.05... Did you notice that? When I did point 0.1, the little, it just moved a little bit, right? You're getting a much better approximation. Well, not much. Somewhat better. If I did point 0.5, it would be way worse. In fact, even then you can start to see how this is actually not a smooth line, but a bunch of broken line segments. Because that's really all Euler's is. In case you were of, ever under the impression that your graphing calculators were plotting nice, smooth, continuous curves, they're not. They're just plotting really close points together and connecting them with straight lines. That's all they've ever been doing. It's all Maple is doing. It's all Wolfram Alpha is doing when it plots graphs for you. It's plotting a bunch of points and connecting them with straight lines. It looks nice and smooth and curved, but it's not. It's really just a bunch of tiny little line segments. It's only an approximation of what the curve actually looks like. That's what's happening here. I did one. See those? Boom, boom, boom. It's exactly doing Euler's method by finding the slope at that point, moving in that direction. Okay. A much better approximation. In fact, notice this. I'm going to put 0.5 in there, which is what we started with. No, 0.1 was what we started with, right? 
okay? And then I'm going to choose an improved Euler's method, and that curve moves already. Even with a step size of 0.1, an improved Euler's method is a much better approximation. And you can see that by looking down here at your delta y's. Delta y's is just your absolute error. So at 1.5, I'm at 0 0.03567. When I was with Euler, I was actually at... Oh, that's actually worse. My delta y... Actually, I don't know if this thing is solving. I don't know if delta y is what I thought it was. Delta Y is not the error. They don't have the error on here because they don't know the solution. So forget that I said anything about this being how accurate. What I want you to look at is just the shape of the curve. It moves, and it's actually closer to where I was with 0 0.05. If I jump all the way up to Runge-Kutta 3 eighths rule, that's actually a very good approximation, even for 0 0.1 being your H. It's an extremely accurate approximation, and you don't need that small of an H for that to work. And all of these would be that way. Boom, 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 boom. These are just different starting points, and you get different tables for those. So if we need the actual value, we just solve the equation and get it like normal? Yeah. And then put that in there? Right. Well, no, the thing to keep in the back of your mind is we're not always able to solve. So the ones that I give you where you want to find the relative error, those are the ones where you have to be able to solve. But there will be problems that we come alongside for different models that we may not have a solution technique for, but now we can still approximate what the solution would look like by finding a series of points that are close to it. Okay. All right, that's all I have to say about um, that. I, actually, it's not. I, I got one more thing to say. That's all I have to say. It's all I have to say about that on tape.